we couldn't be more excited than to have another event coming your way today. Thank you again to our loyal audience who we've seen many times, and I hope that there are first time listeners in the room as well. We welcome everyone to what we've positioned today as a town hall. Uh, I understand we're not physically in a town hall, nor are we elected officials, but uh, there are important conversations that are going on uh, in a national and a global scale. And, and as conveners with a very large uh, ecosystem of participants within the riot community, we thought that it would be interesting to bring our ecosystem together to have another honest discussion around racial equity and, uh, and, and how that intersects into the tech and business communities. Last week, we had Desmond Wigan on the program and Desmond is the founder of Battery Exchange, a startup company that had gone through the Ride Accelerator. Uh, Desmond shared a lot of his uh, journey in terms of being a African-American founder, what were some of the hurdles that he encountered, what were some things that maybe helped others to think about the challenges associated with uh, not being a privileged white male in the startup world. Uh, today, we want to dig in to more of that conversation, but also what does it look like in more established corporations? And Riot, again, is not the expert here. We're, we're trying to bring expert voices to the table, and I'm excited to have a couple of expert guest speakers uh, with us today that I'll introduce momentarily. But what we're gonna try today is a little bit of an experimental format. So thank you for joining us and, uh, and giving us a try. We wanna make sure that everyone who is participating today has the opportunity to participate in this discussion. So we're gonna start with a couple of polling questions that we're gonna pull up in a moment because we wanna get a little bit of a baseline of where the audience is. We're gonna have a discussion with our two experts and then we're gonna break the entire audience just at random. We're gonna assign folks into small group breakout rooms where we would love to hear from everyone kind of what's happening in your organization. What are things that you wish were happening in your organizations? What are uh, successful things that we've seen people do in terms of driving real uh, change and, and equality? And, and where are the gaps and shortfalls? We've been invited to do a follow-up piece with WRAL TechWire after this event to kind of summarize what we hear collectively from the group. Uh, and so we have some folks that will be you know, taking notes, gathering data, and we'll share all that out afterwards. So we've got a great program. We promise not to run longer than an hour this afternoon, but uh, thanks for joining. Uh, at this point, before I introduce our two speakers, I'll ask Caroline Griffin on our team to put up a couple of poll questions on the screen. So those that are dialing in on the phone may not see this, but if you're, if you're online, there are three very simple questions I'll ask you to answer. And I, I want everyone as well to think about kind of in the backs of your mind, how do you define diversity today? You know, what, what does diversity look like? What does it mean organizationally in the places that we work and the organizations that we act with? And, and, and what do you also, how, how do you also define inclusion? Uh, we have three parts of the title of today's event diversity, inclusion, and a bias towards action. So the action piece is we're going to collect this information, we're going to publish things out, and then we're going to have follow-on discussions and try and publish out best practices, try and start to walk the talk on some of the ideas uh, that come out. So you're going to help us to catalyze action today. But um, with that, yeah, if you'll answer these three questions, we'll collect that data and we'll share it out again later post-event. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I'm excited to introduce our two speakers today. I, we've got Denitris Farrell, who's the founder and CEO of DF Consulting. She has a really interesting background, having worked for many, many years for some of the biggest uh, corporate brands in the world. Uh, she is right here in Holly Springs, North Carolina. Uh, she'll share a little bit more about herself and her journey through the corporate world, as well as an interesting entrepreneurial venture that she has started recently uh, in DF Consulting and Coaching. Um, we've also got Brandon Johnson with us. He's a global solutions engineer at NetApp. NetApp is one of our sponsor companies. 
And uh, Brandon has worked both in North Carolina and now he's in Sunnyvale, California. So he's gonna give a little bit of West Coast perspective for us. Aside from his day job, he's also been highly involved in uh, coaching and mentoring and driving various STEM initiatives and diversity initiatives within his organization. So Denitris and Brandon, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mentioned that at the start that you know, we had a little bit of discussion last week about the entrepreneur's journey and, and we're interested in, in hearing some of each of your personal journeys here, but, but Denitris, maybe let's, let's start with just at a high level. You spent a lot of time in corporate America. Um, you got drafted, I believe, into some roles where you were working on diversity initiatives and things, but that wasn't necessarily why you were hired, you know, your, your, your career path. Just share a little bit of your experience from corporate and your, your journey and, and some of the things that you encountered. Yeah, um, so a couple of thoughts. One, from the company perspective, right? You think about corporate, everyone right now is releasing statements around their commitment to diversity and that's commendable. Um, but what I experienced in corporate is that there is this bucket of diversity money, right? That we are using to recruit, we are using to uh, fund affinity groups um, to try to address the inclusion aspect. But there is a glaring gap when you think about equity. So when you think about diversity and inclusion, we sometimes forget that, that E in the middle of there, that's equity. And so there's not a lot of uh, sustainable, tangible, measurable effort around making sure we get underrepresented minorities to equity. A lot of times what I've seen is that we put diversity as one big bucket, right? And diversity by itself just means the presence of differences. So that means everybody has the potential to be diverse, right? You grew up in the suburbs. Okay, you're diverse if everyone else grew up in the city, right? So when you lump it all in this big bucket, you water down your impact and um, you also leave some folks out. You leave those who are in the most need out of the conversation. And so I think one thing that is an opportunity is to shift the focus from just diversity to explicitly looking at how do we create equity for those who have historically been underrepresented um, because from the employee side, right, if I switch gears and think about what it's like being a black woman trying to navigate Fortune 5 and 100 companies, um, it's a challenge. There are hurdles at every at every turn, and there are usually just a few who make it, right? And those are the ones who are uh, perceived to be exceptional. But if you ask anyone who's made it, they will tell you that there are seas of other exceptional people who look just like them who didn't have the chance. We often we often celebrate the rose that grows out of concrete, right? It's, oh my gosh, this rose grew out of concrete. This is amazing. Such a pretty rose, right? But we never talk about all those other seeds that didn't make it out of that concrete. And we never think about what if instead of that rose being in concrete, we put it in fertile soil and we gave it the right sunlight and nutrients and then you wouldn't have this itty bitty pretty little rose. You'd have a huge rose bush that's gorgeous and blooming and and can feed um, and, and create other rose bushes. And so that's what happens. We, we when we have these um, the exceptional make it right and we have all these barriers in corporate that folks have to navigate navigate through and some are able to but most aren't most aren't it breaks up I, I read a study um, a couple of days ago that said if you look at the percentage of African Americans or black depending on what you prefer I prefer black so if you look at the percentage of black folks who are in the country who go on to get a undergraduate degree who go into corporate if, if those percentages um, consist or persist once they enter corporate America, there should be 50 black CEOs in the Fortune 500. Today there are four and they're all men. Yep. We've yeah. got work to do. There's unquestionably work to do. I think it's interesting when you point out the equity argument that, um, yeah, the, the third word inclusion, 
it, until there's true inclusion, there can't be equity because I believe equity means, you know, a seat at the table, part of decision making, you know, equal voice and, and uh, you know, we need to include people uh, as a foundational layer before we can even hope to, to achieve equity or, or the kind of diversity we talk about when we're, we're talking about in this discussion. Um, Brandon, you uh, work in a very large tech company. They've got a huge campus here in RTP, obviously, uh, same, same in California. Have you seen the, the same kind of challenges that, that Denisha just described in terms of there not being enough fertile soil for all the possible seeds in the company? If I can continue that. Absolutely. Way. That's, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good way of phrasing it. Um, you know, in tech in general, there's a, there's a shortage of uh, minorities that are in tech. Um, there was a stat at a, at a conference recently at Afrotech, and it said that on average, uh, tech companies have are 5% black. So when you talk about equity, right, you, you have a small, a very small pool of people that can even aspire to make it to that, that C-suite. And then when they do get into companies, we don't necessarily have all the tools and things in place for them to go down an executive path. And I think, you know, as, as corporations, especially right now, you're hearing a lot of companies discuss diversity, inclusion, and belonging. I think now's a good time for us to all look at, you know, our processes and figure out how do we start um, changing that pipeline a bit? How do we start to um, not only find these people, but also cultivate them and so that there's multiple. And I, I agree that there's a lot of one-off situations and that poses its challenges within itself, right? Because that person likely, let's say in the example, there's a few male CEOs um, that are uh, black. That person has to represent, you know, the entire black community. That's a lot of weight for anyone to bear. So I think we, as, a, as, as, as companies, both large and small, we have to do our due diligence and making sure we're giving everyone a fair chance, whether you're, uh, you're black, white, Latino, whether you're male or female, whether you're gay, lesbian, transgender, um, you have to start looking at people and making sure your processes are promoting the type of behavior and culture that you want within these companies. Have you seen much difference between, you know, working in North Carolina on the East Coast and working on the West Coast? You know, this is a, I, I know it's a national issue, but I'm, I'm interested if there are geographic differences you've seen. I have seen a little bit of a difference. Um, I think it's largely uh, the demographic here. Um, in Silicon Valley, I would say this, at least from what I see, I'm in the San Jose area. Um, it's primarily uh, uh, white and uh, Latino here. And uh, like, there's not many black people. Like I've, I haven't seen a crowd of black people unless I've gone all the way up to Oakland, right? So um, California in general is very progressive, um, but in this area, because of the nature of the industry and tech, there's not as many minorities um, as I expected it to be. Um, you know, you have Google, Facebook, et cetera, they're all here, but it's still an overabundance of uh, other uh, other cultural groups. And I think that's just local to the demographic. Yeah. In terms of how, um, I guess, the Raleigh area, RTP, is different from here, I'd say the biggest difference for me was scale. You know, everyone here is, um, most of the people here are in tech, and there's a lot of companies. There's more of everything. Like, RTP is a big tech hub, but the scale here is just so much broader the challenge with that is everyone is so focused on themselves, it seems, or being super competitive because you have to be, right? Like, I notice the difference in people being patient, impatient here. It's, it's much different because everything is so fast paced. No one has the time to look up from their phones or their computers and they're just focused on their, their bubble. And, um, you know, it's refreshing to just look up and, you know, look around sometime and look up from your phone. And I realized that was a huge difference because of the scale and the pace. Everything is so rapid here. Yeah, interesting. So one of the the gaps that, that you identified to me, Denitris, as we were talking ahead of this program in the corporate world was really that, that these companies aren't necessarily architected well to coach and to mentor and to, to bring up you know, promising young uh, black and brown employees. Um, and that spurred you to action. Um, mm -hmm. to, I guess, t take a little bit deeper cut of the onion on, on what it was that you saw and, and 
what are some suggestions that you might have for companies that do want to develop more black leaders, but just aren't getting the job done right now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of thoughts. So first from the employee side, right? Minorities, a lot of us are the first to do it, right? We are the first or second generation college student, the first or second to make it into these corporate spaces. And that's a great accomplishment on the one hand, but in and of itself, it's not enough. So what, what ends up happening is if you think about um, our, my, our majority counterparts, right? They have um, parents who were in corporate, uh, cousins who have their own companies, things like that. And so casual conversation that happens at Thanksgiving dinner or casual conversations that happens at the cookout or how do I navigate? How do I navigate these challenges that I'm facing? Those, those things don't happen for us because we don't, the, our, our family doesn't have those experiences. Our networks don't have those experiences. So what that ends up being is that we are all out here winging it. We are all out here just trying to figure it out as we go. And so, so not only are we in an environment, so if you put me up against, um, no, not against, but side by side with a white woman, right, who's had some corporate experience in her family, right? So not only does she have some experience to, to, to lean on, I'm out here winging it because I also have all of these additional barriers that are coming at me that may not be coming at her in the same way. And so I think coaching has this, this super powerful transformative um, way that you can one, help those individuals who have not had that type of coaching before, that, that access before, think about how do I navigate these things? And, and what I often hear when we talk about coaching is it's often, um, it's often related to mentoring and they're not the same thing. They're explicitly different. You could have some mentors who do coaching, but for the most part, they're different. And I think that we tend to rely on company sponsored mentoring programs. Hey, we're rolling out this great mentoring program. All of our executives said they're going to mentor, uh, you know, 10 employees each. Um, but what happens is two things. One, the, the leaders naturally gravitate to people who are like them. Like that's, that's just the natural bias. So you naturally gravitate to people who are like you. And so you're naturally giving more of them. And then the other thing that happens is because it's company sponsored and because these are people in leadership position, the minorities who are in front of them are not fully able to be authentic. They're not, they're still trying to perform in these conversations. And so when you have a coach who is not in, is not required to, or is not in control of your career, who doesn't have the potential to turn into your next sponsor, um, because uh, Black folks, minority folks are notoriously under sponsored, right? That's part of why we're not moving as fast as we could. Um, when you have someone, you don't have that risk of if I say something, if I, if I admit that I don't get this, if I admit that this is bothering me, if I show some emotion about this thing that happened to me, will that hurt me, hurt my career or not? So if you had someone that you don't have to worry about that, then you can be fully transparent. You can be fully authentic and you can get to the root of, okay, I understand where you're coming from. Let's think about some solutions to push you forward. And that solves a piece of the problem, but not the whole problem. Because the other piece of it is we've got to get in with the companies to create processes that, um, uh, that make it equitable for us. So I know we talked about inclusion a little bit before. Inclusion is like this Band-Aid almost right now, the way it's being done. It's being done where, okay, we've got these affinity groups and we're doing some trainings here and there. We want you to feel like you are welcome here but you can't make me feel welcome unless you also, like we can have a cookout and we can have a party, all that's cool. But until you also make sure that my salary is the same as my counterparts, until you make sure that I'm being promoted at the same rate as my counterparts, until you do that work, then all of this is just noise. It's a band-aid. It's just something cool to say. It's something to make you feel like you're doing the right thing, but I don't feel included because we had, a potluck and we celebrated Black History Month for at the whole company. Okay, cool. But look at this check. <laughs> look at my title. Look at my counterparts' checks and titles and what's going on. There was a study that said um, 
uh, the, the Federal Reserve of Cleveland just released a study that said there's all these things that contribute to the wealth gap in an America between races. But the primary thing, it's not home ownership, it's not stock investment, the primary contributor to the wealth gap is income inequality. And it's sad that we, we think that getting an education is the answer, but it's not quite the answer because you can be a black person and the head of your household with a bachelor's degree and you will still on average make $30,000 a year, not in your lifetime, in a year, $30,000 a year less than a white person with this who's head of the household without without a bachelor's degree yeah yeah it, it there are many statistics like that that are just plain wrong there's no question that that income equality piece we've talked about quite a bit and i think actually we need to talk about more uh and, and maybe even that's a topic we need to tackle as an entire episode but uh i think what that leads to is maybe the deeper rooted thing that I hear from you, which is, you know, really it's a power inequality. It's that inability to be the decision maker at work or to have the signing authority to take actions or the autonomy to make decisions, those kind of things. Um, one thing that you said kind of rung true to me, a lot of what you said rung true, but you, you, you made a bunch of points, but one of them is that in terms of finding and, and having those advocates and allies within an organization to help you grow those those mentors those coaches so on and so forth but right now it sounds like from what i heard from you that you know the onus is on you to find those folks and that's not right the onus should be on the organization to provide them or us as individuals to reach out and to help we're, we're not really going to solve this until Till the white people take action <laughs> i'll stay kind of at, at a high level um uh, is that a fair statement yeah absolutely i think that we have passed the point where we could be sort of i i did a town or not a town i did a mini summit last night and we made the case that we are past the point where we can it's it's okay to just say well i'm not racist it's yeah. at this point we have to intentionally and actively make conscious decisions on a daily basis to be anti-racist to dismantle so if we go back to the rows and concrete at this point we have to all be willing to pull out our jackhammer every single day and start busting up the concrete and if you're not willing to do that then you're not willing to do enough then you're just paying lip service Brandon, you have done, taken the initiative yourself to try and bring people together around these conversations to take actions. What, what has the response and participation been? So do you mean internally in the corporate space or more broadly speaking? Uh, either. So, you know, even before NetApp, I was involved with a lot of uh, STEM programs. Um, I've, I sit on two boards, one here in California and one in South Africa. Um, I realize that there's a, there's a, you know, lack of opportunities for minorities already. And that we often have to go above and beyond just to have a seat at the table if we ever get a seat at the table. Um, so a lot of people that I work with, at least in the community, uh, whether it be through Riot or any other organization, they seem to get that. They seem to understand that we have to start preparing young people at, at y much younger ages. I think, you know, I'm very fortunate for this. Uh, my senior year of high school, um, because I was in AP classes, I couldn't take any senior, I couldn't take any AP classes my senior year. The reason being is because my mom forced me to do this apprenticeship program. In this apprenticeship program, I worked as a product engineer for an entire year in high school. That gave me a leg up. So when I first went to the, um, the career fairs at, at my school, I wasn't one of those people, you know, that they say, hey, you know, get some experience and then come back and see us next year. Well, you need experience to get experience, right? And so I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. And so for me, I realized that I needed to open up doors for people if I could, especially at, at earlier ages. Otherwise, they may not make it in, right? Yeah. Internally at, the, at, at our company, there's a lot that we need to do. Um, to be frank with you, um, we've we've done some things. Um, I'm a part of a group called NetApp Networks of Blacks in Tech. Um, we've we've set a couple of initiatives internally. Uh, we go recruiting at events. Um, we try to make the culture uh, feel like one of belonging if you're a minority when you join the company. 
Um, but bro- broadly speaking, our organization has to do more, and not just NetApp, other companies as well. Um, I think, well, I fear that a lot of corporations um, right now, they're, they're in panic mode, and they want to do something. And whatever they decide to do, I hope that it's in the, you know, it's a long-term thing. It's not just lip service, right? We've heard a lot from organizations. We've seen several statements. If you've been on LinkedIn, if you've been, if you do a quick Google search, several companies have talked about diversity and inclusion. As much as we talk about diversity and inclusion, as much money as we spend on diversity and inclusion, why do these industries still look the same as they did 10, 20 years ago? Yeah. Right. uh, That means your action and processes are not being executed properly. Right. And it seems like lip service. You know, I feel that all companies have to do, at least right now, this is a good time to do something bold, take action and, and ultimately change the demographic of um, your, your work culture, because it's something that certainly needs to change. Um, I read a stat yesterday um, from McKinsey and they did a report. They do a report every year, um, but it talked about how diverse teams perform better. Everyone knows this. But what they did is they, uh, they quantified it. They provided metrics. And it said that companies, uh, the top 25% of companies that had um, a diverse team, an executive team specifically, whether it was a, a woman or a black person or in some, any minority, the top 25%, the, top 25 um, the upper 25% of companies versus the bottom 25% of companies, there was a 25% uh, probability that they would overperform and achieve their revenue goals. Yeah. The numbers the numbers work out, right? So why are you not doing this? If, if we're seeing that companies that have executives that are diverse and they have teams that are diverse, they're, perform- they're more likely, 25% more likely to, you know, generate additional revenue. Why aren't everyone, why isn't everyone doing it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. every company exists to sell a product or service. So you would think that this is something that they take seriously. It, it's extremely uh, frustrating and perplexing. And, and I think some of the answer absolutely lies in this power dynamic of those that are the most wealthy and in the most power uh, hold on to that by not allowing change to happen. And, and, and that's, you know, that, that's a, a big problem. Uh, the data, by the way, uh, I don't remember if this was 2017, 2018. I think it was in the Atlantic. I saw a study that looked at the top performing cities across the United States by GDP and the top 10 most economically successful cities mapped exactly to the top 10 highest percentage diversity cities in our nation. So even at a a much larger scale in a company, uh, yeah, diversity is good for business. Uh, So that said, things aren't changing like they should. Uh, let me ask a final question of you, and then we'll we'll break into some breakout discussions. What are some specific actions that you have seen, or you might suggest? Could you repeat that? That was a little bit of an echo. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so the the question for each of you is: What, what are specific? actions that, that organizations can take or employees can take in their organizations that can help to start change. You, you talk about organizations keep just doing the same things. Do you have some thoughts on what they should specifically do differently? Yeah, I have a couple of things in mind. Uh, the first, you know, you have to realize that I, I'm pretty young myself. I'm only 28. Um, there's, let's, let's take it a step back. When you look at the baby boomer generation, a lot of them will be retiring in the next few years. That means that a lot more younger people will be going into leadership positions much sooner in their careers. There's going to be a lot of opportunities, and those positions will be filled by uh, millennials. They will be also filled by Gen X, like people who are in you know, college now and high school now. Why is that important? If these companies are going to uh, continue to grow and they want to uh, retain talent and bring in uh, talent, they're going to have to start thinking about these things. They're going to have to start training their managers on how to lead across uh, multiple generations because that's going to be important. Someone my age could be, you know, a manager in a few years over someone who's twice my age. And I also could be managing someone that is, you know, fresh out of undergrad. They could be 21, 22. You have to understand these differences and what motivates these individuals because they do have differences. I'd say that's the first thing. The second thing is, I would say, 
spending more money and spending more time at not only HBCUs, but uh, underrepresented communities. I don't think we do enough in those areas, right? I think we do enough just to hit the check boxes, but I think there's a lot of talent at these places, and oftentimes they had to work much harder than people. I went to a PWI. I went to NC State University. It certainly wasn't the only school that I could have gone to, um, but because I went to NC State, I too, I will get looked at more so than someone who may have gone to an HBCU. It doesn't make me smarter because I went to, you know, a public white institution, right? I think we have to do a better job of doing that and, and going out into these companies. I'm sorry, going out to these universities and recruiting, because if you want diverse talent and we see a poster board and it has, you know, a few minorities, but when you join the company, no one looks like you, it seems like lip service. Yeah. And I would say the, the last thing is, um, you know, I, I can't harp on this enough. There is certainly a shortage of uh, managers that look like me, right? I think everyone who is a manager should be forced to go through training to understand the unconscious bias that they may have. These are the likely the gatekeepers in your company, right? We have CEOs, we have executives, but are they individually interviewing us? No, it's usually the people who have the hiring authority. And if those are the gatekeepers and they represent a culture that is not in line with where the company wants to go to retain these, these newer employees, then there's always going to be a disconnect. And so I, I think all companies need to have training specifically about um, their hiring practices, um, you know, people may not even know how to interview. You may ask me one question and ask the same question a different way to someone else, and they may blunder, they may plunder their entire interview. That's that that right there can't happen, and I feel that that is happening at a lot of places. And talking to some of my friends, there's there are differences in the their interviews. Yeah, thank you for those ideas, Demetrius. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um... You know, I'm a little bit further along in my career than uh, Brandon. And so I agree recruiting is a gap and it's a need. But I think that that's that is where a lot of organizations are putting their money. They're investing in building a pipeline. They're investing in trying to recruit more diverse talent for these entry level jobs. But what happens is that you get us in. You don't nurture, you don't develop, you don't promote, and so you then you don't retain. And so that's when you lit, end up with a whole middle of managers who look nothing like the folks that they're managing, right? You end up with this whole middle section who, um, that's, where, that's where it drops off. That's where your, your minority talent drops off, and that's where everyone leaves. It's like buying this brand new energy efficient house you've got top of the line heating and ac but those darn kids keep leaving the the window cracked right and so all the money is going out the door you're investing you're investing but it's turning over because another thing that's happening is this is not the same generation that there was before folks aren't staying at companies for 20 and 30 years and we're not just happy to say we've got a job or we've got a good job right folks are now recognizing that if if I'm not being treated, if I'm not able to grow and develop, it's time for me to go find that fertile ground. If this isn't it, I'm not, the, the, we used to be told, you know, bloom where you're planted. So wherever you are, make the best of the situation that you're in, try to blossom and bloom wherever you are. Well, no, if you're planted somewhere that does not value you, that's not developing you, that's not promoting you, that's not helping you grow, then it's time for you to go find fertile ground. And that's also why you see so many minorities starting their own businesses because corporate America is proving that it's not quite fertile ground. And so there's so much talent the talent's there and it's not just new talent, there's old talent that's sitting in middle management waiting for someone to give them their chance, but we, we're, not giving, we're not giving the chances, we're not breaking down those barriers to promotion. Yeah, it, what I like about the feedback you're providing is the things you're describing don't actually sound very difficult to do. We just need those managers that are in the positions now to do that. Um, so with that, let's pause. We'll move into some breakout discussions and then we're going to come back in about 15 minutes to the large group format again. And we're going to take some Q and a for our speakers. 
And when we come back, we'll take questions through either the chat window. Uh, I see there's some activity on chat already. I haven't looked at it, but you can post questions there. Or there is a raise hand function uh, that you'll be able to raise your hand and ask questions. But before we do that, what we're going to do is we're randomly assigning people into small groups. So we're going to break into a bunch of groups. Each group will have a note taker in the group that has uh, already been identified. So they will introduce themselves uh, and capture some, uh, some notes. But really what we want you to do as audience members is just provide your reflections and your comments back on some of what you've heard already. Uh, if you are working in an organization that is doing something interesting that you think is making a difference, we would love to hear about that. If there are things that are missing that you would love to learn about as far as resources in the area, ask those questions, voice those concerns. Uh, this is you know, pretty open-ended, but our hope is to, to capture a lot of information that we can then aggregate together. And as I said at the beginning of the program, you know, we'll publish out some results and we'll publish out then some next steps to, to, to take that bias towards action part of the title of today's events. Thank you everyone for taking a little tech journey into a room and back out of a room. And I hope we didn't lose anyone along the way. Uh, we had some good discussion in the, the group that I had. I apologize, our last speaker got cut off as she was making a good point, but I think I've captured it uh, for the record. And uh, as I mentioned before, we'll, we'll gather the notes from all the, the different groups and we'll put, put them together in some kind of a, a, an article or, or report or output and make sure that everyone who has registered today uh, gets a copy of that. In the meantime, we promised some Q&A with our guests and um, Caroline, I'm going to let you read that out. As a reminder, you can type questions into the chat or there's a raised hand function in Zoom. You're welcome to raise your hand and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can over the next about 10 minutes. Or if you feel comfortable, simply just unmute yourself. Most of these in the chat box are um, comments. Okay. And we're capturing the chat too. So I know a number of folks have published like links to good articles and reading materials and things. We'll make sure to, to distribute those as well. I had a question from a startup's perspective. Um, with a, like a team of like less than five and bootstrap limited resources, we really, like we still really want to do what we can. Um, and I realize that's not like we don't have unlimited, free, not unlimited, but we don't have as many resources as bigger companies might have. And so with that in mind, what can we be, what steps can we be taking right now to make sure that we're on the path to have an inclusive community an inclusive workforce and a diverse workforce? I'd say since you're at the beginning of your company, I came from a startup. Um, so since you're in the beginning phases of your company, you know, the, the leaders that are there now are going to set the company culture. So it's important for, you know, even if you don't have as big of a diverse team as you would like now, it's important for you all to keep it in mind for any new person that you bring to the team. Um, they will set the vision, right? Eventually your goal is to grow the company. So if you're going to uh, focus in this space, I would recommend um, getting on a lot of the boards, like a lot of um, like, like angel list, for example, right? Just looking for people who are like-minded, people who care about your cause and uh, making sure that when you are looking for, you know, different leaders on your team, make sure they represent the culture that you want the company to overall represent, you know, a year or two from now. Um, I think a lot of the times when you're early in startup phase, you focus on just the technical aspects or just the, the monetary aspects, but you have to focus on the overall team building. If you want to build something that's sustainable, you, you need to really focus on the team. I mean, obviously, you have to make a really awesome product. I think product vision um, is improved when you have a diverse team. 100%. Thanks. And I'll just, this is, this is Jared. Um, great question. Is it, is it Jay Shree? Jay Shree, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think the challenge is uh, for five people, and if you want to, you have to very intentionally, like purposely, we have five people where this is our, this is our ethnic diversity. We want X, find that person and hire 
a person from whatever background. I mean, with only five people, because if you, if you, I mean, that's like a great opportunity. So then let's say the company grows and in three years, you've got 200 people, 300 people, you know, you can say, Hey, those first, you know, 20 people, we had 50% diversity. Right. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I think that's the challenge. I think what people don't do is they think that that feels like, you know, people who aren't as fluent in this think that's like, oh, that's a quota or that's, that's unfair, like reverse, you know, reverse kind of, you know, racism type, you know, all these nonsense things that people, but if it's like, hey, we want to do this, well, then just go do it and hire someone and don't, don't bring in someone who isn't what you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. I saw a question in the chat about, um, are there any recommended programs out there for, for training for DEI or, uh, or you know, speakers or others that anyone has, has seen at their organization they might recommend? Yeah, I think someone recommended um, Racial Equity Institute out of, uh, I think it's Greensboro or it's Goldsboro, I think it's Greensboro. Um, I just actually last night did a training for the Networking Women of the Triangle that was phenomenally uh, well received. So there's tons of folks out here having these conversations and doing these trainings. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk and customize something for your organization. And we're happy to connect anybody to the news as well if you don't find her directly. Other questions? We oh, had a, a get, we, I was going to say real quick, there was a speaker at NC State, some of you may have attended, uh, named Raven Solomon. She gave an awesome presentation. It wasn't focused on uh, diversity directly, but it talked about um, how to, you know, motivate teams and individuals. And it did talk a little bit about diversity. I thought um, that her presentation was great. Um, I will put her information in the chat um, so you can see where her, her talk tracks are. But she, she hosts these type of sessions um, virtually. She's based in Charlotte. Thanks. I'll encourage you to the point that Jared made a moment ago, even if you're in a large organization, if you're, if you're in a position where you do hiring and firing, think about your small team as that five person startup or eight person startup. And you are in in control of getting 50% or better diversity in your startup within your company. And uh, if enough middle managers just take that attitude and do it, the numbers trickle up. So, um, you know, I, I think this happens through a whole lot of individual effort, efforts and then hopefully, you know, pressure on those decision makers at the top. But there is a grassroots opportunity here. And to Tom's point as well, those, those managers in sort of positions of power when it's review time and it's time to grant merit increases, you, you have visibility of what everyone's making, right? You can try to level the playing field some. I know that, you know, with some of it is dictated from the top down, but you have the opportunity to try to make some things right there in that role. Another thing that people can do, and this may sound a little radical, but, you know, Riot is a team that's comprised primarily females. And and when we talk about pay equity between men and women, you know, I kind of joke, but it's not really a joke, which is that if we really want to level the playing field, we have to start overpaying some women. Mm-hmm. Right. We, you know, to get that balance, we have to overcorrect a little bit. And where that can be really powerful is if you're in a position where you can do that, whether it's a black person or a female or whatever. Um, you know, one of the questions that often gets asked in an interview is what are you currently making? And that creates an anchor point. And, and a much better question to ask is how much would you feel you need to be paid in this position? You know, don't, don't take the bias of what's been made in the past. But if you can get somebody's anchor point a little bit higher, when they then eventually go on to a new position, new job, you put them in a much better position of being able to, to earn what they should be earning. And so sometimes if you have that ability and that luxury, if you can overcorrect, that is good towards the, you know, the big picture for everyone. Because it's likely that your minority candidates haven't learned how to negotiate their salary. They haven't, they haven't even been taught that everything's negotiable and that they should push back on whatever your first offer is, right? Yeah. It's, it's, we just accept what, what's handed. And so you've got this ban, I can pay you between 60 and and $100,000. And because I don't push back, you're going to offer me 65000 
no, check, check your thoughts around that, right? If everyone you uh, interviewed and everyone else you've had in that role, what does a person with my background, what should that person be making? Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Do we have a last question before we adjourn? I don't see any more um, questions, but really great comments. And I just want to say it's really great to see a lot of the Riot sponsors on here today. I see Mike Steele from Trolley and Susan Sanford from RTCC and some Rap alumni as well. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Sin hey, Emory. So um, this is awesome. Thank you all for being here. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. We will share out uh, the article once it's posted on, on TechWire as well as any other kind of follow-up we have. We will respond with the results from the poll questions earlier. Uh, and I encourage everyone, just like we did at the beginning of the conversation, to think about, you know, has your definition of diversity or inclusion changed at all? Have you thought about equity in a different way? And uh, we'll encourage everyone to do your part to bring those thoughts back into your organizations. If there are ways that Riot can be of help uh, through either influence or, or additional conversation or whatever the case may be, uh, please reach out. We care deeply about technology and we also keep care deeply about equity and uh and working together to create a robust economy not just for the people at the top but for everybody so thank you for joining today and we look forward to the next session everybody have a good day